Hi everyone, welcome to the live. Um, I'm gonna invite Daniel Mate to join. So stay tuned for a moment as we figure out the logistics of invitation to... Hi everybody, welcome. like Instagram world. Hi. Hi, Logistics Solved. Logistics Solved. This is my first time using like a ring light because my friend yelled at me and he's like, you're doing inst all this Instagram stuff and like you have to get a ring light. So <laughs> I was going to say the lighting is, is, is noticeable. Is it? Is, is, it, is there a difference in lighting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you're like, you stand out from the background in like a, in a way that only lighting can do. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm just sitting in this chair. I kind of blend into it. There we go. Wow. Okay. Yeah. This is a whole other world. It's a bit blinding me, but well. Did you like put on foundation too? No. Oh. This is just my skin. <laughs> so uh, anyway. you don't, you don't have like hair and makeup staff for your Instagram lives. Not really. Oh, this keeps turning yeah. off. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know why. It's, I'm like still so low tech when it comes to Instagram. I yeah. feel my friends are always like, you need to get your, you, we need to see you in HD and you're just giving us basic lighting camera stuff. And I guess yeah. it all depends, you know, how, how passionately you want to be an influencer. Not that passionately. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's powerful. Um, but I do like connecting with the people, you know, the virtual world is such a, so strange sometimes because there's elements of disembodiment there and I like more embodied community connection. Yes. But it is a good way to reach people and have conversations. So, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, it does have its drawbacks uh, for sure, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm a, uh, recluse and a, and a and a human phobe so it's nice to just be alone in my apartment with my phone because i don't like people i'm kidding i like people but i get a little scared of them sometimes yeah i think we all get scared of other humans um okay well welcome everybody maybe you're welcome to introduce yourself um maybe say where you're calling from so we get a little bit understanding of the geography of the world um someone just called and us the two cues people cutest people on Instagram, which is crazy because there's babies on Instagram. <laughs> it's true. That is crazy. Um, yeah, well, we wanted to do a live for a couple of reasons. Kuwait, here we go. Um, BC, Canada, Berlin. It's always so nice. Calgary. Cambridge. Daniel, Fancy. you're bringing the Canadians. Yeah. yeah. Brazil. Yeah, well. Ireland. And Sweden. Oh my God, we got the whole world here. My neighbors in Connecticut, Kakalak, North Kakalaka. London. Yes, shout out to London. Favorite city. Um, okay, well, we wanted to do a live um, both because we just finished doing like a four week Jewish healing circle, which was really powerful. Um, and we're launching a new series called mapping the moment on Sunday, which we welcome you all to join if you want to be part of a community that's not through Instagram, um, but that goes a bit deeper. Um, and yeah, we wanted to chat a little bit about that. But we also really wanted to talk about Passover and you know, Passover is coming up in like less than two weeks and how we are holding Passover and, and everything that's happening in Palestine and you know, Passover and Palestine feel like very connected. Um, so we just wanted to chat a little bit about that. I know that there's a lot of really beautiful initiatives that are already going on around anti-Zionist Haggadot and how to frame certain things. But um, yeah, we know that this is like a really big conversation for so many people, so. Yeah, this and we're gonna keep in mind that lots of different kinds of people are watching, Jewish, non-Jewish, Jewish observant, Jewish not so observant. So we're going to try and um, make sure that, you know, we translate things and make sure that this is a conversation that's accessible to anyone. But I think 
Passover has always been one of these holidays that I've loved because although it's located in Judaism, it speaks to themes that affect everybody in a way that I can't think of any other Jewish holiday doing quite so much. And it's the kind of holiday, if you're going to invite a non-Jewish friend to take part in any significant Jewish holiday, you might do Hanukkah, you know, but Passover is the one that to me has always showcased our tradition in the richest way. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Passover in some ways is like the central Jewish holiday of the year. Um, so many rituals, so many deep, deep rituals. And yeah, I think it's something we talked about in our last Jewish healing circle. Um, and something I've been really thinking about is right the Passover story, which is all about the exodus from Egypt. It's about, right, oppression, liberation, Moses, Pharaoh, um, the parting of the sea, like all of these um, right, because you can talk about the history of it, but you could also talk about it in terms of like the metaphor and the symbology of it. Those are things that I think have influenced like most, most of the world really um, in so many different communities in so many different ways, right? So in that way, it's not just like, oh, this is a Jewish story, but it's actually also a very fundamental story that has um, informed so much of culture, informed so much of other religions as well. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the teachings around oppression and liberation, you know, every year, sadly, they're still so relevant, um, because our world is still so broken. Yeah. I think of the Bob Marley song, Exodus. I think of the black spiritual go down Moses, which we sing at my family Seder, which is like one of the great freedom songs of all time. And that's from, you know, the black, I guess the church tradition, but in the times of slavery and Jim Crow, like it's such a, and then, and then there's the psychological kind of individual or intra individual uh, lessons of Passover that I've always been interested in, you know, like Egypt, the literal, the word for Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim, right? Mm -hmm. Which means it's, it's at least it's derived from narrow Tsar. So it's a, like the narrow place. Yeah. And we all have these narrow places within ourselves. And um, so every time Passover comes around, I find myself thinking about global issues. I find myself thinking about my family and the culture of my family and the trajectory of my family and our history and where we're going. And I find myself thinking about myself and the year I've had and the year I want to have. So it, it's just, um, it's, 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 a, it's a nested Russian doll of meanings that you can that you can find. What's your favorite Passover teaching? I mean, of the two of us, you're by far, well, you're by far the more scripturally um, well-read and, and I mean, you went to yeshiva. You, you've, you've studied this stuff very, very, very deeply. Yeah. So, can we start with you so that we don't get off on the foot of ignorance? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was seeing someone in Arabic, it's Masa, same root as for destiny. Yeah, Egypt, it's Masa. Um, yeah, and what you said, right, about the um, Mitzrayim, right, like it in Hebrew, um, comes from the, the Tsar, the narrow place, which, right, in Hallel, which is the scriptural, uh, like, praise verses, one of the things that we chant is, Min hametzar karatiya anani right, like, from the narrow place, I called out to God, and God answered me with expansion. Uh, which is a very strong kind of imagery for Passover as well, right? Because it's like going from constriction to expansion is so much of the the teaching. Um, and obviously it's like the desert. Um, the desert is like the most expansive place you can be, um, right? And, and what does that mean to be in the space of expansion? So, yeah, I love that, that like teaching of... Um, what it, like how can we look at like where we are constricted in life and how can we call out for more expansion and this process of like the contraction the expansion yeah. um though my that's just in response to you my, i don't know what my favorite teaching because there's so many favorite teachings of passover and every year for me it feels so deep um but i think something i'm thinking about this year which i think i've said to you um there's an Egyptian Jewish woman, she passed away years ago, but um, Jacqueline Kahanaf, and she talked about um, 
she basically, you know, she, she was born in Egypt and she has a really powerful essay about what it means to be a Jewish person celebrating Passover in Egypt. Um, because, right, the whole story is about like liberation from <laughs> Egypt in some way. But like she was like, but Egypt is my homeland and this is where my Judaism belongs. Kind of like an Israeli and, celebrating Yom HaShoah in Berlin. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, Yom HaShoah is the Holocaust Remembrance Day yeah. for non-Hebrew speakers. Um, but yeah, but just really thinking about it, like I think that in the Jewish community, sometimes our, so many of our holidays are around like, oh, we were oppressed and now we're free, you know, kind of that. They tried and to I think some kill us, we won, let's eat. That's the typical right. trajectory. I think that sometimes there's like this, um, because there, that narrative is so strong, there's not as much examination of like, well, who's the oppressor and who's the oppressed and what's who's the enemy and who's not. And we just kind of take these stories and we're like, well, of course we're the oppressed, so then hooray, <laughs> you know? And I think, especially just thinking about that story of this Arab Jew who was th talking about Egypt and Passover, like it really makes me think about, especially in the Passover, the characters of like Moses and Pharaoh, like it's, it's not like, oh, this is Pharaoh and this is Moses. And like, th that's, we're on the team Moses and then that's it, right? It's more like, we really have to examine who's been made to be like the enemy and what the construction and the psychological and obviously then physical impact that becomes of that. And yeah, just really thinking about the way that in that story, right, Egypt is kind of seen as the enemy. And then, and then like, there is sometimes this construction that happens in, in definitely Israeli society, right, where that like Arabs are the enemies or the terrorists or the this. And then, of course, that means Palestinians and the way that that impacts that. So I've just really been thinking of like, what does it really look like to let go of this perception of like the enemy as the other? Um, and especially, right, like, what does it look like to um, deconstruct in Jewish community this, the ways of thinking that obviously comes from Zionism around seeing Palestinians and Arabs as enemies? Um, well, that's certainly the more constricted view. And you're, it sounds like you're moving towards an expanded view but so what does it look like yeah i mean i think it's a that that to me is part of the project of like deconstructing zionism right is to um understand like for me like palestinians feel like my family you know because i grew up in jerusalem and because like my grandparents always had palestinian friends and even my parents like palestinian people were always um part of my history as a Jewish person mm -hmm. and I think so much of my life has been this struggle around like oh the people that feel like family to me are deemed as an enemy by some of my other community my like uh, some my Jewish community and just how uncomfortable that is because you're like wait and and then you're literally separated because you're Jewish and now you're all of a sudden on the other side and you're like well why does my Jewishness mean that I'm on this side why can't I actually still be on the Arab side you know, and um, all this kind of like side picking, which for me, it's like kind of losing the point of talking about justice and liberation, um, which is not about like your identity, right? Because if justice was just about identity, then there would be no work to do, right? If just the way that you're born means that you're just or unjust, like that doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense right? Mm -hmm. For me, justice is about the choices that you make. It's about the responsibilities that you take. It's about um, all of that, right? The shared values. Um, well, and your, and your relationships with others. I mean, justice only exists in relationship to others. Yeah. And how do you, yeah. how do you form, how do you align those relationships with, with the values? Totally. You can't be just, if you lived in a cave, there'd be no sense in talking about justice. It's true, right? Yeah, the way that it's relational. Anyways, what are you thinking about for Passover? What's your favorite Passover teaching? Well, I've always, I've always liked how into the psychology of the characters the story gets. It, there's a lot of reactions and responses throughout the story. And uh, I actually wrote a song like 13 years ago now, maybe, that has become like a hit tradition in my family we sing it every year in place of 
just telling the story. So there's a part of the Seder. So Seder means order. And one literal meaning of that is just the order of the ritual dinner. There's, you know, certain symbols and certain things. And then there's the telling of the story. It's kind of the centerpiece. It's called the Magid, which means the telling. And um, in place of just telling the story, we sing this song, which I wrote. It's about like 12 minutes long because it goes through the whole story. And it's called they didn't like it. And every single verse tells some, some part of the story, but it ends with the chorus where somebody doesn't like something. So, so it starts with, you know, we, we used to be slaves in Egypt. And you know what? We didn't like it. Like, it kind of sucked. And then uh, uh, Pharaoh saw that or occurred a prophecy that a Jewish leader was going to rise up from among these these slaves. And you know what? He didn't like it. So what did he do? He put out an edict. Uh, I think the, the lyrics are, so he ordered up an edict, which is another word for law, because he had seen the future, and the future that he saw, he didn't like it. And then Moses' mother sent her baby down the river in a basket of reeds, and she didn't like it, but, she, but that was a considered response to the edict. And then Moses grows up in Pharaoh's castle or Pharaoh's uh, palace as his son. And he sees a guard beating a Hebrew slave and he kills him right on the spot because he didn't like it. Now, that wasn't the response. That was a reaction right in the moment. And it's an understandable one. But then we all have we get to wrestle with, OK, how would I react in that moment? Um, and just on and on and on through the story. Um, Moses sees the burning bush and the burning bush commands him to go lead his people to freedom and Moses doesn't like that then he goes tells Pharaoh let my people go Pharaoh doesn't like that and on and on and on so I really like that aspect of it it's very uh it's a drama it's a it's a real uh story of um fate and consequence and destiny mm -hmm. um and in, in particular the one that I like the most I think is Pharaoh's psychology of just a leader holding on to power because that's what leaders do. He's not evil exactly. He's living in a time of slavery. He's not an anti-Semite even. He's just a powerful dude. That's the thing. With a hardened heart. With a hardened heart and a stiff neck. I guess God calls the Hebrews a stiff neck. Yeah, that's people, not but Pharaoh. That's yeah, us. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's us. But that's interesting too, right? Even us, the freed, oppressed ones, we get shade from God when we get to the desert about you guys are with, you guys are missing slavery. You're whining about your freedom. You're whining about being in the expanded place. But yeah, Pharaoh, the lesson of Pharaoh and the plagues, it's like, when do you hit bottom? When do you finally decide enough is enough? And the fact is, Pharaoh could have changed his mind or his heart theoretically after the first plague or even before the first plague or the sixth. But it had to get real personal for him. And in my own life, uh, catastrophe has been a, my best teacher. And um, it's just a matter of kind of lowering your threshold of what level of catastrophe you're willing to say, okay, that's my cue to change. Yeah. So, and there are consequences to, to having a hardened heart as well like what is when you have a hardened heart you can't see reality actually and we think of the heart as oh gooey and emotional and then there's the rational mind but actually the, the the heart and the mind if they're not working together neither one is very intelligent yeah so that that's what i would say are my the yeah ones that resonate the most and you know i, I love that, that about catastrophe that sometimes we actually need catastrophe to awaken and that's something that's so harsh about this human life is that um, there is something. And, you know, I recently had acupuncture um, where this woman, the acupuncturist, she um, showed me the word for catastrophe in Chinese. And she, she was like, okay, let me show you. And she wrote it down and she showed me in the letter form of like part of what the teaching of catastrophe is that there's basically two options, right? Because catastrophe awakens you to a pattern and then you have the option of either releasing that pattern or spiraling into that pattern. Yeah. Um, but it kind of highlights this moment of choice. And 
I think that, you know, just to also just be explicit is at the time that we're in, um, and this is something that, you know, Asafi Liyasha Liv, who's um, just came out with a book about the Black Panthers, um, the Mizrahi Black Panthers, um, who wrote a Haggadah, and a contemporary Haggadah, contemporary retelling of the Passover story. So for which, those who don't, those who don't know, this is a, this is a group that took its inspiration from the American Black Panthers. Yeah. But these were formed in Jerusalem, Arab Jews from Arab lands. Yeah. Uh, for you know, from Morocco, Yemen, all that, and um, opposed the white Jewish Israeli power structure from within. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so part of the, in the Haggadah, they're, they're actually rewriting the Haggadah. Uh, yeah, thank you for someone for writing Jacqueline Kehano's work there. Um, thanks, everybody. You're also on top of it. Um, but um, yeah, they, they cast the prime minister at the time, who was Golda Meir, as, the, as Pharaoh. Um, and talking about um, the Israeli state as being, right, this like kind of new... Um, Egypt in that story, right? Kind of this new oppressive regime. And um, and I think that's so interesting, especially with thinking all these themes, right? About like Egypt, the desert, the promised land, like all of that, right? Because especially for a lot of Arab Jews, it's like they were promised coming into the promised land. And then they got there and they're like, actually, this is not the promised land we were promised. And actually, right? Like they, you know, in the Arab mind is like, right, the, um, the Ashkenazi establishment, they called it, right? Which was really um, the main kind of oppressor. But definitely I feel in this moment, right? Like the Israeli regime is definitely the Pharaoh. Like, I think that there's kind of no question about that. And I think if we're kind of applying the Passover story, right? It's like, well, I like what you said about catastrophe and that for Pharaoh, it had to get personal. Um, it's kind of like, I think this is a question that we all have is like, what is it gonna take? you know, what is it going to take, not just to end the genocide, which is obviously critical right now, but also just like, what is it going to take for Palestinians to actually be free mm -hmm. in their land? Um, mm -hmm. Like, where is Moses? Where is God? Right? All these kind of questions um, that, and, and like, what's going to, like, yeah, where's the Red Sea parting? Um, yeah, and what is it? going to take for Israelis to wake up out of their um, addiction yeah to uh, because if you want to talk about a constricted place um, Israeli society used to have a more expansive feel to it there was room for genuine aspirations to peace there was room for advocacy for a peaceful diplomatic Wait, solution. What are you talking about? <laughs> when? Oh, 70s, 80s, back in my day. I mean, there were people, like massive protests from the start of the Lebanon War. Groups like Shalom Akhshav had standing. You had groups like Meretz, people like Yossi Sarid and Shulamit Aloni. There was, there was a counterweight to the very constrictive part. Now, maybe these people were naive, and thinking that Zionism could coexist with equal rights. I'm not saying they were correct, but in terms of a humanistic um, strain in Israeli society that would mourn and be horrified by what's happening right now, I think that was more present before, say, the Second Intifada. I feel like things have, I mean, you're from there, you, you would know better than me, but that, yeah. was my, that was my perception when I lived there in 93, for instance, for 10 months. I, to me, yeah. I think there's a bit of an illusion there, um, mm. which I think is a very North American narrative of like, oh, Israel used to be good and now it's gone really bad. And part of that obviously comes from like some racism towards Mizrahim. It's like, oh, when the Mizrahim really came, like that's when all of a sudden not, right wing politics. Not, started. What, I, not what I meant. At I, know all, that's I, not, I, I know that's not what you meant, but I think that's part. I of actually I'm talking about the Ashkenazi Jews who pieced out of the peace movement and they were like, you know what? See, there's no one we can talk to after Oslo fell apart. They got all disillusioned and right. gave up at least the pretense of being peaceniks. But that's also kind of the that narrative that Oslo was in some, or like the peace oh, agreements that were totally. building for Oslo were oh, in some ways actually yeah. peaceful, which they weren't. And I think that, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, Obviously, I, there have always been anti-Zionist Israelis, that's for sure, uh, who have been organizing with Palestinians. Like, that's since 
the creation of the state a hundred percent but i think in the kind of like peace i actually personally i see more anti-zionism mm. happening now than what was happening in like the 60s or 70s i mean that, that again seems depends, to... but yeah, in that's... a formal structural way yeah but I, I guess what i mean is could you imagine 20 30 years ago that these pop songs that are actually openly calling for the annihilation of all Palestinian civilians and the murder of international Palestinian celebrities. Yeah. Was the culture itself so constricted and so openly bigoted? Or it seems to me that was confined to like settler groups and everyone else was just kind of like mildly like, oh, we wish we, you know, we'd like to have peace or quiet or whatever. Yeah. It wasn't so bloodthirsty. The, the, it hadn't metastasized into a kind of open fascism that the seeds were already there anyway that all i'm talking yeah. about is that the constri the constriction that i sense among israelis and a, and a narrowing of an unwillingness to even look and yes you're right that especially in the younger generation there's many, many israelis growing up now increasingly i think who are looking at this country and be like i don't i, I don't want to be a part of this regime yeah. and they're imagining other possibilities we have podcasts like Yala and um, you know the one state solution you you have so many friends in the movement there that have been doing good work for a long time anyway my point is that when a society loses all empathy it becomes pharaoh's land yeah the society the hardened hearts the hardened hearts the 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 gallows humor but it's not the gallows humor of of uh you know say the the jews of russia suffering pogroms or in the ghettos it's the gallows humor of the executioner mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah well just just to respond to that and i love people are like oh we love to see you guys disagree respectfully um for sure i mean we have to have conversations and talk about narrative because and i'll, I'll talk about more because i think passover story is so much about storytelling and narrative and how we hold narrative um but you know what you're saying i think this sometimes is my frustration around the narrative because it seems like oh israeli society is getting more right wing and look at these pop singers and all this stuff but like i don't know if you read like early zionist thinkers they weren't less bloodthirsty oh, they no, were just yeah. they were just covering it up in a certain western european intellectualized philosophy right. that was appealing you know, like I think some of the red, the rhetoric that you see coming coming from the ground, sadly, is coming more from Mizrahim, right? That are a bit, you know, seen as more like barbaric and like look at these crazy bloodthirsty ones. But I think that's part of the the difficulties with Zionism is that right? Like actually, the 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 origination of Zionism was so bloodthirsty. Yeah, it just was covered in a certain western political politeness or something that appealed yeah. to the western ear so there was this narrative that was formed like oh israel was so good or so you know and now look that now it's becoming more um you know mizrahim are becoming more right the right wing ones and now it's becoming more barbaric or whatever it is but to me that's kind of a distorted narrative of thinking about it i think that um the origination was extremely bloodthirsty. And I think what we're seeing now is, is a continuation of that, obviously an escalation that's like leading and has led to genocide. But also I think part of what we're seeing is also, right, as you said, like the young generation, right? That's not like necessarily people now writing theories and going to Britain and being like, sign this paper and whatever it is, right? It's not as in, in that orientation. It's like people who are like teenagers teenagers um who were just fed and grown up on this um like insane society um yeah and, and millennials just a quick response yeah. and, uh, <laughs> you know people of the millennial generation are, are also more worldly in terms of connection to the world with the internet this is the age of trauma healing and and an awareness of intergenerational trauma much more so if you're a sensitive millennial Israeli, I imagine you look around you at this army you're supposed to serve in and yeah. you, you, maybe you, you're willing, unlike your parents were to read what people outside of Israel are saying about you. And, you know, you're there's that. I think also my, the narrative, the way I was holding the narrative is also a self-serving one, because I like to think, even though I've disclaimed it and disowned it, 
I still have fond memories of my left wing Zionist summer camp days. I do. It was so much fun. We had a great time. I felt yeah. And and the and the warm fantasy of a of a kinder, gentler Israel was at the center of that. And so well, that speaks to and, also. And, but just quick, the because yeah. uh, what made me think of it is that when I think about the constriction of Israeli society, I think about the TikTok videos, right? And these TikTok trends of Israelis making fun of starving Palestinians. Well, sure, technology has allowed for that. Didn't exist back then. But if I actually think back to summer camp, there were simulations of pre-1948 where counselors were walking around with towels on their heads, speaking gibberish Arabic, Israeli counselors, because they were the only ones who spoke any Arabic. You know, is that so much better? No, it's the precursor to it. It's 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 not discontinuous from it. So I think I, I think there was a self-serving. Yeah. Like I was I was like polishing my nostalgia yeah. with that one. No, I'm glad you said that because it also it's parallel to me of sometimes how people think about kibbutzim, right? Which yeah. are like this like social seen as like the social egalitarian utopia. But kibbutzim were literally built on land theft. I mean, of course from Palestinians, but also from Mizrahim and other like this, this, the myth of the kibbutz and the way that it still like occupies the space in the Western site. Occ occupies, no pun intended. Uh, there was a pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> no, but like, you know what I mean? Like people like actually think of kibbutzim as like this beautiful yeah. utopian society, even if they're anti-Zionist or whatever, they still somehow like cannot let go of that. And, you know, even for me, it's like, I grew up, like my parents are like, Kibbutz Seymour is some of the most violent places. Like you don't, you, you're scared to go there, really? you know? So like, yeah, of course, Kibbutz Seymour, just like some of the most racist places that literally organized a social order over land theft that only allowed Ashkenazi Jews to have access to some of the most beautiful land. You know, like it was always like a very, very racist project in that way. and. I think what it's you're always... witnessing right now is Daniel Maté having some of his remaining Zionist illusions I'm sorry. To, death by the, really? to death by the truth of someone who's actually from there. No, and I will say that it is always so hardcore, especially in North America, especially in the Jewish community where people still have fantasies about yeah. kibbutzim because you're just like, how can you fantasize? And I think people don't actually know the history of the kibbutzim. They just are like, oh, like social egalitarian belonging, I you know, like. totally don't know the history because kibbutz was our fucking template for our entire camp. We were basically modeled as one. Yeah. We made all these consensus decisions. We pooled our money. We did our own labor, you know. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's like, I hate racism. Me too. <laughs> Fucked up. Uh, no, I mean, it is. It was like a land theft project, you know, and it yeah, was covering it up with like social ideals. But I think what part of what you're saying and part of what we're talking about, Kibbutz Seam, right? That's like the way that I feel so many people are still holding on to Zionism because they don't actually know the history, but they're just like, well, I kind of like what I think it might mean, you know? Um, or, yeah. The, there's a lot of right people are saying like fantasy narrative and I think kind of just coming back to the Passover story, one of the things that I think is really, really powerful about Passover, which I think is part of how Jewish people have formed as like a people, yeah. um, is our, you know, you could even call it sometimes obsession, but whatever, there's beauty in it, right? Like storytelling. It's like literally like we tell the same story every year. And um, especially right, Passover is a very kid friendly holiday right it's very much engaging the kids it's ha it's making them understand it's it's bringing the kids into the lineage with understanding where they came from what their history is like what the values are um it gives and I them think the that... questions to ask it what gives them the question they, they play a crucial role the youngest are supposed to ask the core questions that yeah prompt to the storytelling totally um and and like you could really think of passover as like this this time for ancestral storytelling, right? Yeah. Like we're sharing our histories, we're sharing our truth. And I think that part of what's really powerful there, right? Because it's not just like, oh, this is what happened. It's also like, how are we holding it? And the construction of narrative and something I've been thinking about a lot for the last few years, really, especially thinking about Zionism and Palestine and, you know, because obviously there's a material reality to it, but so much of the material reality of what's happening is rooted in the ways we hold narrative and the ways we construct narrative and the way we make meaning out of things. 
And I think bringing in more intentionality, critique, investigation into those questions feel, feel very vital. Yeah. I'm still sitting with the kind of... Uh, You're still sh shocked by the kibbutz? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not that I'm shocked by the kibbutz thing. And it, I'm, it's not that I'm embarrassed, although partly I am, but it's just, just remarkable to me how just when you think all your illusions are gone and you, you see everything clearly, <laughs> you find out that there's still a constricted place in you that's holding on to something. Because what does it mean to hold on to something? You're tightening, right? Right. And um, yeah. obviously, I mean, it makes total sense to me, but to think about the kibbutz I lived on and to think that this entire time I was there, it's very likely, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go look up the history of that one if I can find it, you know, because I think there are maps of where old previous Palestinian villages were that were, you know, turned into Jewish settlements. To imagine that I didn't know and didn't care to know. Mm. And that, in fact, the entire educational system that sent me there and, and that kind of created my year, the, the year program was based on me not knowing totally. and that even now with all my like good politics and you know ally badges or whatever that I could still be holding on to that it's a good reminder that just when we think we're free we still still carry with us parts of the bondage yeah and not the consensual kind yeah totally yeah, I think, and I think, you know, to me, it's part of how that happens, what you're speaking about, because obviously you are committed to Palestinian liberation and you've done so much work about it. So it's not like you're holding on to this because you don't believe that. It's more of just like the way that the narrative was shaped and was told and was imparted onto you is actually very vicious in its psychological yeah. manipulation, you know, because I do think that sometimes there is, it's like, yeah, all this like history and presence of violence is like covered up by very, very vague social ideal words. Oh my like, God, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, and I think Zionism has done that for so many people, especially the American public. It's like, oh, like freedom, <laughs> you know, just like Zionism is about freedom for Jewish people or like they just kind of use these like very vague words that then people can't really disagree with because you're like, well, I'm, I'm not against that value. We used or, to, sure, equality. Yeah, we used to literally talk about the Zionist dream, unironically. Like, we were pursuing the Zionist dream, we loved the Zionist dream, whatever. And it's like, a dream is something that ideally you wake up out of at some point. And we weren't willing to recognize that it was actually a nightmare. It was a nightmare in the making for us, for Jews. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't, if it wasn't already, it was already a nightmare for your side of the Jewish world in many work in huge ways that you've spoken about so eloquently in, in many places and it was already a massive nightmare for the people who used to live there someone in the in the chat said something about releasing defensiveness mm -hmm. in those moments where we realize we're still living. and i feel like actually the lesson of like pharaoh maybe that's the best way to sum it up it's that the, there's a cost to defensiveness mm -hmm. when someone comes to you with an invitation to be expansive. What is let my people go? It could, it could sound like a terrorist demand if you're in power, right? That, yeah. That's the defensive way of hearing it, let my people go. But if you're not being defensive, how would you hear that? You'd hear that as let that addiction go, <laughs> let the thing that doesn't actually serve anyone go. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not saying that's what the what that's what the Torah says about it or the Talmud or whatever but that's my that's what comes to, to mind for me and then instead of hearing it as an invitation to be a a free land yeah Pharaoh heard it as a threat to something that he thought was important and so he tightened his grip hardened his heart, heart and got defensive mm -hmm. and defensiveness is something that I know very very well it's a real um, reflex reaction for me and I don't even know I'm doing it yeah other people know other people know I'm doing it but I don't know I'm doing it well, un until I there's do. a 
there's a familiarity and comfort and there's almost like the narrative becomes more important yeah. than the felt experience. Yeah. You know, I think that that's what happens a lot, right? It's like, we're like, well, this narrative is right and I need to fight for it. Even if I kill my soul to do it. Right. And that's where it kind of gets really vicious where we get really disembodied. And yeah, I guess one of the things that I wanted to also talk about is um, the role of trauma, because a lot of the ways that I think of the Passover story, right? Because, it's like, okay, the ancient Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh and Egypt, and then Moses came and liberated them across the Red Sea and all of that. But part of the teaching is that they didn't actually go straight to the promised land. They actually were not, they weren't capable of doing yeah. that. Yeah. They had to be in the desert to wander in the desert because, you know, the desert is a very, very potent healing space. Like that is actually where you let go of all your burdens and, you know, all the things that you're holding on to. And um, I remember I was actually in a desert with a friend, maybe it was like last year or two years ago, but one of the things that could for Passover, you know, we always go to the desert for Passover. And one of the things he said is just like the desert makes you lighter. It makes you remember that you don't actually have to hold on to so many things that you thought you needed to hold on to. And there is, right, even the word for desert in Hebrew is midbar, um, which is such, a, I think there's such a powerful word, um, which the word basically means mean, davar, like from the word, which obviously the word is the word of God, um, which actually right before going to the promised land, they go to receive revelation, to receive the Torah, to receive the word of God. Um, but I think that there's something really interesting there of like, you can't really hear and you can't really understand things when you're so caught in the narrative or what's been happening. Like you actually need to go to the desert, you need to empty, and you need to let go and then you need to be able to like hear like that's only how you can hear the word of god and i think the desert you know for so many traditions and for so many prophets have been the place that prophets run away to to listen more deeply yeah. right because then they're not distracted by everything else they can really like be in that expansiveness and like listen more closely so there's something i've also just been thinking about um you know that like especially right with the story of the Jewish people. I mean, obviously there's many stories of Jewish people, but a lot of the times, right, that the, the narrative is framed like, okay, from the Holocaust to the state of Israel, um, but where's the desert space in between, right? Like three years, where's that three space? Three years is not enough. You know what I mean? Because it's yeah. like Holocaust trauma, and you can speak to this more, because I don't have that in my lineage, but from what I feel from people, it actually is so intense. It's so intense to work through. It's so intense to heal. It's not just like, oh, this happened and happened however many years ago and now I'm over it. Like there's a massive, massive rupture on Jewish bodies. And I, you know, for me, part of being anti-Zionist is actually also loving Jewish people of saying like, why, like for the life of God, like who thought it was going to be a good idea to militarizing like the Jewish people right after one of the most traumatic moments, right? It's like, we need space for healing and we need the desert and we need to rest and we need to feel like, you know, like, so this is something that I'm constantly also thinking about is like, what is that space of the desert? And yeah, curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it's like giving a, a group of people with the, the world's worst PTSD, a bunch of bombs and and machine guns and being like go heal, go heal your trauma with this and you can see that you know the israeli military is so paranoid there's been countless yeah. incidents where they kill their own people because they think they're palestinians or because they're mizrahim and they appear arab and they're palestinian and you know but like it's not actually as accurate and targeted i mean of course we know this but like or because actually... they're being or because they're being taken hostage but that's a different question sure but there's so much paranoia yeah. in it because they're constantly on edge and it actually turns into like a really psychotic society yeah totally well the desert thing is 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 wonderful um you know i'd like to think that, that america has served in some ways the purpose of a desert space for some of us we came here and what did we do we when you say we, you mean... I mean, Ashkenazi Jews from Europe. Okay. You know, like, 
like the the descendants of the Holocaust, mainly. Uh, um, I mean, this may be to totally rose-colored glasses as well, you know. But we made art. We 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 joined another society and tried to hold on to our traditions while never being a majority anywhere, except maybe here in Brooklyn and <laughs> parts of Manhattan. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I don't have much to add to it, that, that you need space to integrate trauma of any kind. You know, it makes me think, like, my, my favorite state in America, not like the culture of it or not where I would want to live, but the state that I, I love being in and driving through the most I mean, up there in the top five is Utah. Mormon Utah. My favorite place in the world is Arches National Park near Moab. Nice biblical name. Um, and it's a kind of rocky desert with all kinds of incredible, I forget what they're called, hoodoos, like these big massive stone structures of incredible shapes and that and but just yeah the open space and after a pretty big catastrophe in my own life the breakup of a marriage i got in my car and i drove straight there without even knowing where i was i was heading to new york but someone told me you got to go through moab and i went there and just there was something about the landscape that just held me actually mm. and i had my closest to a spiritual experience out there in that national park um and i needed that and i i could have taken more time with it i kind of rushed through it and then rushed back into uh busyness and coping and was left with some residue that it took me years to to let go of but yeah that feeling of um of constricting around your trauma. And I think you're exactly right, that it's the narrative that we constrict around. That's what we hold on to. And that accords with the understanding of trauma that in the myth of normal, my dad and I um, write about that trauma is not what happens to you, it's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. Well, what happens inside of you? Well, on the nervous system level, certain constrictions happen, certain associations, certain reactions, certain patterns and flags flashbacks and whatever. That's one thing. That takes time. You can work on that. But what really happens inside of you that you don't even notice is the constricting around a certain narrative or story of what it meant. Yeah. I got taken advantage of. I'm the victim. I can never let that happen to me again. These people are all like this. I, ha totally. I can never be that way again. I can never be that open hearted or that open. And we make we make decisions not about the past, not even about the present, about the future. When I say I can never be open-hearted again, or I can never trust again, whether trust myself or trust someone else, I'm not putting that decision in the past, even though it's based on the past. I'm not putting that decision in my present. I'm putting it in my future. And now I'm living into that future which is a very constricted future. I can't be like that. And whatever that is, that was a part of my birthright. Like that was a part of my, who I was when I was born. Yeah. And now I have to section that off and put it behind an apartheid wall inside myself. Yeah, well, you know, I think this is where, um, for me, you know, obviously spirituality is such a big part of my life. And I think this is where, especially the Western kind of educational system has really robbed us of, um, a lot of intelligences that are 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 so fundamental, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like so often we think of the world as like this external world and it happens to us and we navigate whatever kind of happens to us without really understanding, you know, for me, if like someone to ask me what is spirituality, like the way that I would describe it is that there's an internal world, right? There's something happening inside and that that matters. And that tending and cultivating the internal world has an impact on you and the external world, right? So like this way, and what do I mean by an internal world, right? It's like 
what happens when we close our eyes. It's our thoughts, it's our emotions, it's, it's our insides. It's literally our internal self, you know? And we were so taught that that is controlled by the outside. Oh, I think this way because I read about it there, or, you know, like we think that it's just like we're getting things from the outside, but obviously we're also emanating it from, you know, the inside out. And I think that this conversation around narrative to me feels really important because the ways that we held narrative really, I mean, we see that in our personal life, exactly in that example you spoke about, right? It's like, if that's how the meaning that I make in it and that's the narrative that then I attach to, it almost doesn't create a possibility for something else to happen. No, it rules it. But out. you know what I mean? And so I think it also just to like the power that, that we have in holding narratives and the possibilities that we um, make possible through the ways we hold narrative, you know, like I really would love for Passover this year to really be an investigation of how we hold narrative and when does narrative turn into ideology, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm which is different than having ideals, but an ideology is, is constricting around your ideals and then imposing them on reality and saying, I, I refuse to look at reality unless it conforms with my ideology or I'm willing to bend, twist, distort, and uh, abuse reality until it fits my ideology. And, yeah. you know, Zionism, you know, I have a song that I, I think I've shared it on Instagram before. I mentioned it on the Bad Hasbara podcast the other night where I took, Herzl's, if you will it, it is no dream, mm -hmm. you know, in Teotsu and so and, and I, my lyric is, no matter how you will it, it's still a dream if you can't see reality for what it is and what it always was. Yeah. Your ideology is only as good as it's actually connected to the full picture of reality. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about the implications of what you just said for activism because i've heard you speak about this and i wonder if you can kind of expand on it but and and so i'll put i'll pose the question okay. and then i'm going to go take one of my customary little breaks okay while you while you talk to the people in the chat i'll entertain the people yeah yeah what's the question? but so but but the question is this like if tending to the, the internal affects the external well activism is about affecting the external that's what we're trying to do free palestine is not our inner wounds and feel better about our Zionist history mm -hmm. or, you know, feel nicely towards the Palestinians. It's like fucking free Palestine, the actual physical material Palestine. But what you're, what you're saying leads to, if we want our activism to be the best activism it can be, we might want to do some inner hygiene around what we're carrying. And that's going to be different for each person. Yeah. And I stop short of giving advice to anyone who's Palestinian in this moment, unless I talk to them in depth and can hear where they're constricted, that I have no advice to give about what they should be thinking or letting go of. That's just not my place. But generally speaking, I would love to hear you talk about, about the connection between doing that inner work and mm -hmm. being a better, better activist. We mentioned this in the myth of normal about how in politics, the right tends to um, take their trauma and idealize the oppressor like the daddy and you know want to become that and the left tends to re, you know just react and react and go against right and yeah. both of those have their dangers anyway that's my question to you hang out with the folks i'll be right back well can i start answering or you want me to wait for you uh you can start answering uh i'll try to listen from the okay. other room Okay. And maybe for folks listening in, if you have thoughts or questions or anything, um, yeah, I'm trying to pay attention to also what you're all sharing. So feel welcome. If you have thoughts and questions about what Daniel said or about anything that I shared, um, there, there's so much I want to say to this question. Um, and I guess First, the way, the way that I teach about it in my spiritual school is that, you know, a lot of the time, um, I, I really like what we talked about, the narrative and constriction, and something just clicked for me about sometimes the constriction is how we hold narrative, right, and the, the hold of the mind, the constriction of the mind that happens. And, you know, I think even in justice movement, sometimes we have this 
view or this vision of what we're fighting for, which is absolutely necessary, right, to keep us motivated in this very, very long and hard fight. Um, and sometimes what happens is that that view becomes disembodied and starts ruling over us. And then, and we do this all the time in our personal life, right? Oh, if I just had this thing, I'd feel okay. Oh, if I just, you know, I'd feel great if I just went on vacation and didn't have to worry about these stresses. But, you know, this is part of the project that I've been working on for years called Jerusalem in Exile, which is challenging this because you could say, right, in the Jewish narrative, there is this way that, you know, people were holding like, oh, if we just come to Jerusalem, we'll be fine. You know, if we just get to Jerusalem, finally, everything will be healed. But that narrative, I mean, obviously not actually seeing the impacts on Palestinians and not reckoning with that major fault. And also, it doesn't take into consideration at all the emotional safety, the mental safety, right? And I think this is part of what ends up happening, especially we see in the US, right? Like the whole American dream, but everyone has mental health issues or, you know, emotional, like, so it's like, oh, okay, like free people, Yanni, but like not actually integrated internally and actually feeling miserable. And I think you see that in Israeli society as well, right? It's like, oh, the Zionist dream, the Zionist dream. But like inside, filled with rage, filled with fear, filled with parents. So it's like, what kind of freedom is that? And I think that this is where for me, right, liberation can never actually be physical. Like it's not just physical in nature. It has to actually also be spiritual. Um, and the spiritual actually takes work, takes individual work and even if it sounds tough sometimes to be like oh but i thought physical liberation is all there is just give me you know freedom give me food housing whatever which is fundamental part of the liberation process but ultimately we're the ones who are fully responsible for our minds for our emotions for our hearts like yeah no one on this planet can dictate how we relate to ourselves you know and and that to me is a spiritual teaching right is that like the core the core relationship that we're working with is actually a relationship to ourselves and we project and we mirror that into the world um and even if the world's issues were no longer there i would still have to work it out with internally and we sometimes forget that because we're so um caught and what the external world is creating for us. And, you know, I think this is where it's also important to, to remember. I mean, obviously, again, I'm coming from a spiritual perspective and a believer in God, and I understand that not everybody has this, but um, for me, right, Earth is not the only world. Like, we're not, we're only, every person that is alive is bound by time, right? We're not beyond time, in our, at least in our physical reality. So, for me, part of also valuing the internal world is also valuing that I have a soul that's in a process of transformation that is also going to be beyond this earth. And this earth being time bound is actually full of mystery and full of confusion and full, full of delusion and full of, you know, I'm not actually going to understand the full meaning of my life and what has happened here because I'm still so in it. Um, and, you know, that's part of the spiritual life is like functioning from a place of faith um, because we don't actually know the full picture. I don't, or as I don't know if the, I really answered your question, but those are... Well, you, you, you went wonderful places with it. Uh, as the great rabbi George Clinton of Funkadelic said, free your mind and your ass will follow. The kingdom of heaven is within. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that... Well, whatever. But, uh, yeah. Should we take some comments from the chat i've got I, I i just got my that was my uncle calling me he's uh i think he wants to talk to me about the seder but i can call him back yeah well i mean gosh as you know it's Give interesting me. i was just teaching um a class about song of songs um in my Malchut jewish mystical school um which everyone's invited to join if you want but um song of songs is a book that we read on shabbat passover um, and part of the question that I asked is like, what, why do we read Song of Songs? Um, right, Song of Songs is a book in the Hebrew Bible that is attributed to King Solomon writing. And um, it is basically a love story between God and the Jewish people, right? A lot of imagery of the lover, the beloved, 
um, very poetic, very embodied, very sensual. It's the um, most roomy, and it's the most roomy, like Tantra, like it's the closest thing we have to, you know, a kind of love scripture yeah. in our tradition. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't like framing it that way personally, because obviously okay. Rumi came later and Tantra came before it, you know, like every tradition has, I think their own really spiritual, mystical, sensual, relational connection to God. Um, but, but sure for kind of the... For dumb, for dumb guys like me, that's the only reason I make these analogies. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, you can, it is a very Rumi like in many ways. Um, but anyways, just thinking about the, wine appears there so many times and obviously in passover we have um drinking the four cups of wine mm -hmm. and i just connected the two together today um because one of my students actually offered this of like right because the wine that we're drinking in Passover, like part of what i've been just thinking about is especially passover the story oppression liberation right understanding all the dynamics of it like where does God fit into that picture? And where does relationships and love fit into that picture? And this kind of connection with love really brought it home where it's like, oh, when we're drinking the wine, we're actually, right, wine is, is not just the physical wine, but it's also like, both in Judaism, it's held as like the power of transformation, right? Because it goes from grapes to wine. So there's a whole transformation process there. So there's something about transformation. But it's also right, this like kind of depth of intimacy, right? As like the wine represents intimacy with God and that that lovership and understanding God is a beloved. So anyways, that was something I was just thinking about in terms of the connection that just landed for me this morning. Um, but I want to mm -hmm. hear also more about your Passover teachings and what what parts of the Magid, which is the, the Haggadah story. Yeah. Well, I don't really have any prepared, um, but one just, just occurred to me. Sure, yeah. Emergence, emergent wisdom. Yeah, well, emergent something. We'll see what it is. I, it's just like, it's like a little thread of something. But sometimes when I notice a double meaning to something or two ways of interpreting something, I follow the thread and I find that there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little subtle, I think. But so in my family, when we talk about the 10 plagues, we always modernize it. Like I come from a social justice family. My, my uncle was a Greenpeace activist for many years. So the environment is very present in our Seder. My dad's been an advocate for Palestinian rights. So we've always included some of that. There's been some arguments and disagreements about how much weight to give it or how to you talk about it. You put olive on your Seder plate? Uh, uh, for Palestinian. We, we should. I want to make sure we do this here. <laughs> That's a we custom put, that we, sometimes we put an orange, you know, for the, the whole feminism thing. Yeah. Because uh, a rabbi once said that a woman belongs on the bima, the pulpit, as much as a orange belongs on the Seder plate. So a lot of progressive Jews said, okay, challenge accepted. Um, but when it, we update a lot of things and we, we try to relate it to the modern world. Uh, um, And when it comes to the plagues, we have a list of like 10 modern plagues, you know? Hmm. And... Do you put Zionism as one? Well, no. But that's what I'm wondering about because the, I'm looking for what is the analogy to plagues. Hmm. So yeah, but that's the kind of thing we've put. Oppression, uh, racism, so on and so forth, right? Yeah. But that's a different meaning of the word plague. If you look at what the plagues are, the kind of plagues there are in the story, in the Magid, frogs, hail, darkness, blood, uh, they're like, they're sort of natural, so but they're consequences of something that visit themselves upon the people and try to wake them up, you know? So I don't think Zionism actually fits that mm. category like zionism is a a curse of a kind like it's it it, mm -hmm, it does mm -hmm. fit one description of the word plague but i'm talking about things like epi like the ep epidemics of mental illness is a plague on our society the epidemics of maybe cruelty yeah but no but that's not not even it like consequence like like, what are the consequences that are visiting themselves upon Israel, you know? 
Uh, um, And what is it going to take to wake people up? And so like looking in our lives for like what chickens are coming home to roost. Yeah. You could say that October 7th was yeah. a play, you know, it's something being visited upon like breaching the, the borders of the false sense of security and it's reality asserting itself. Right. And they are the, it is the natural unwanted consequence of years of policy and refusal to wake up out of these illusions. It's the, it's the wages of constriction, you could say. Mm -hmm. So looking looking at it that way would, would, would mean that we'd have to look beyond the obvious plagues and kind of squint our eyes a bit and look closer and say, what are we suffering from Mm -hmm. that we're not willing to admit we're suffering from, you know? Yeah. Just taking like a harder, like a, just a, a slightly more precise look at that. I wonder if that could yield something. Yeah. No, I like what you're saying because, right, plagues are supposed to come and awaken. Like, they're supposed to, like, be in some ways like this harsh thing. But then I'm like, wait, what am I doing? Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I was just like struck by, right, the whole let my people go, which one year, you know, I actually did a let my people heal. It was <laughs> like a Jewish healing. Um, conference which i was like okay that feels like the truth for this moment come on like, hadar hadar missed opportunity if you if you if we'd known each other back then you can solve the lyrics still... of this. no 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 come on let my people grow grow it's let my to... people grow as opposed to it because it rhymes it sounds yeah. just like go let my people grow let my people i don't grow. Love, love the word grow i don't know why neither do i but it's so damn catchy anyway let my people ahead. grow I think let my people heal honestly sounds better. Maybe. <laughs> but anyways, I'm just thinking about the parallels between like let my people go and let Gaza live. Um, just feel very connected. Um, like they, they they feel like this, the same request on some level, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. Free, free Palestine is let my people go. Yeah. But even just like the let Gaza like, live, like that chat. Gaza live, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, All right, chat. We'll have a we'll have a little poll in the chat here. Doesn't matter because <laughs> she did this years ago. But just heal versus grow. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one other Passover teaching. This is nice. We're just t- talking Passover. Um, that I really love. Um. Uh, um yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, so, you know, this is something that is, I think, one of the most powerful teachings for me about Passover, um, which the Hebrew, right, says that um, we went from being Evid Paro, being slaves to Pharaoh, to being Evid Hashem, to being servants of God, um, which is the same root, Evid, Evid, um, in Arabic as well, um, right? So, uh, which yeah, Avadim Hayinu. So yeah. We, uh, we were slaves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Avadim is plural. Uh, Avad is like um, a slave, but it could also be a servant. And I think that it's really interesting of thinking about the transformation process. Because sometimes, you know, and this is to me one of the big critique of like kind of Western freedom, right? Where the West is very much like, oh, freedom means doing whatever you want. It's having no relational accountability having, you know, just you decide what you want and that's freedom. Yeah. Um, but actually, I think that ends up being a very harmful um, understanding of freedom, right? Because it, when we let our desires just do whatever they want, like what kind of freedom is that? We're just then slaves to our desires, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and I think that's kind of the Western psychosis is like just full on hedonistic culture that's just like, well, I'm doing my desires, but why isn't, why don't I feel better, <laughs> you know? Um, versus I feel like the more traditional spiritual understanding of freedom is that like, actually freedom is about a certain level of service, right? It's, it's service to God, which is mm. really about service of humanity, service to people, um, service to land, service of something, right? Like I need to know what I'm in service to, to actually be free. Um, mm. Mm. 
Yeah. I was just looking up a, there's a Joni Mitchell lyric that you just reminded me of. This is from her song, Come In From The Cold from 1991. She says, we, she's talking about her youth, her idealistic youth, probably in the 60s, yeah. which was a time of freedom and shaking off shackles and individualism and hedonism. And, you know, she says, we really thought we had a purpose. We were so anxious to achieve. We had hope the world held promise for a slave to liberty. Mm. Freely, I slaved away for something better and I was bought and sold. And all I ever wanted was just to come in from the cold. Yeah. Freely, I slaved away for something better, you know, and, and that idea of being a slave to the liberty that's sold to us and then sells us mm -hmm. as commodities totally. uh, on the, on the so-called free market. Right. And I think that that's part of the trick, right? And, and it's a hard one. And I think we all fall for it in different ways where like something is like sold as freedom, yeah. but it actually keeps us chained. Um, and it takes us time to wake up and, you know, you can think that very much about the Zionist project, right? Is like something that was sold to a lot of Jewish people as freedom, uh, but actually keeps us bound to oppression in a really, really toxic way. Um, so, or to quote another Canadian, Leonard Cohen, it looks like freedom, but it feels like death. It's something in between, I guess. It's closing time. Yeah, that's true. And I feel like closing time is coming. For Zionism. Yeah. Amen. Hopefully. I mean, I think that's like, right, that's also part of the spiritual liberation, right, is being willing to go into the unknown. And psych psychology says this as well, like, right, when do we give up a pattern? When the presence of that pattern is actually causing unbearable pain. And we say the fear of the unknown is something that is easier to face than the pain of the presence, mm. you know, mm. because I think that so often we're like, we get so scared of the unknown and something new and something different that we're just like, well, we have to stay to what's happening now because mm -hmm. I can't even afford to think about things being different. Better the, but at a certain better point, the devil, you know, better the devil, you know, than the devil, you don't. Yeah. That's what they say. Uh, at a certain point, um, Right, the, the presence becomes way too painful and you're like, I need to just let go and I need to yeah. go into the desert, into the unknown. And actually, whatever happens, at least having the possibility of liberation, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's always been the way for me. And it's a matter of, like I said, lowering the threshold of what it takes to get there. I think that might be one sign of maturity mm -hmm. where you actually learn the lesson of, oh, I remember this, this doesn't get better. Yeah if I continue down this road. Like, yeah. that's God's law or the law of the universe only wins about 100% of the time. Right. So I can fantasize that I can game the system this time, but uh, yeah. being, and then, and, and, and maybe that's one way of thinking of being a servant of God, just letting yourself be commanded by the way it is. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, but having some spiritual mission and being a missionary and out there. But it's like you obey. And we're living in a society that says, do not obey anything except right. the police. Because they're here to keep you safe and free or whatever. But, but like, don't honor any limitations. You can be all you can be. Just do it. So yeah. on and so forth. Don't. And uh, um, as a teacher of mine has pointed out, limitations is what makes life mm. totally yeah getting pretty philosophical here yeah i mean this to me this is part of the depth of jewish tradition that it is very philosophical yeah, yeah and it and it mandates that we sit down and have conversations that other people can hopefully benefit from how are people doing out yeah. there yeah i probably should go in about 10 minutes yeah, I know we've been chatting for some time. Um, well, one thing I wanted to bring up is that, you know, the, the Haggadah kind of ends with this um, chant right at the end that says next year in Jerusalem, um, which it doesn't necessarily mean, right, a literal Jerusalem. It could also be a metaphorical Jerusalem. It could be this. But so I've heard from different Jewish activists that this year they're saying next year in a free Palestine, um, which I really like that as yeah thinking about 
where we are now and what we are hoping and praying for. Next year, you're in a, an expanded place as well. Yeah. Next year, maybe next year in the desert. <laughs> Yeah, someone asked, can I ask a logistical question about the circle? Do you want to share maybe a little bit about um, what we're doing on Sunday? Yeah, well, let's hear the, let's hear the logistical question. Yeah, ask us a logistical question, but, you know, you can start yeah. chat. Um, so, it'll follow a similar format to uh, our Jewish healing circle, which is to say that every Sunday, hi, Mira, um, every Sunday, uh, we can Convene on Zoom, and, and uh, not necessarily every Sunday. I think we'll be skipping one week, which we need to make an adjustment in the schedule. We need to remember to do that. I think we're skipping the fifth. Is that right? Yeah, we'll so send that. Yeah, yeah. But logistically, it'll be uh, this Sunday, the what is it, the fourteenth, um, uh, and then whatever. We'll we'll send that. Um, yeah. Someone basically. Asked asking about a payment plan. Um, yeah, like totally, that's definitely fine. Just feel welcome. The best way is to reach out through the website, malchut.one, there's a contact form and just um, write to us. And um, yeah, like if anyone needs a payment plan or can't afford it for whatever reason and still wants to be part of it, um, please always wel feel welcome to reach out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, partly the cost is to, to allow us to do it sustainably. It's also to make sure people have skin in the game, you know, like you're showing up to, to contribute and be contributed to from others, you know, and, and we want there to be stakes. Um, but yeah, it's a place uh, that has, you know, we, in the hour and a half session, there's, uh, we each reflect on a particular theme of that week. And I think we have a structure laid out for this coming one. It's there on the website. Um, the first week we'll be talking about um, intentions. I mean, there's the whole point of it. The whole point of it, it's called mapping the moment, orienting ourselves in disorienting times or something like that. And that's gonna look different for each of us, but I think we're in a time that for a lot of people feel bewildered by. And one of the things that that each of us does in our social media presence, each in our own way, is try to give people some coordinates, some some ways of navigating the current moment. And we thought if we joined forces, it would be a really potent, uh, concentrated container for that. And so we'll be looking at different approaches to how to make sense of uh, the current moment. I was saying to you last week, I think, Hadar, that that, that there's a that usually when we think of the word seder, which means order, we just think about it in terms of like a menu, like this happens, then this happens, and this happens. But it's also about making order out of things, out of chaos. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways to do it. There's no right way. So we're going to be sort of speculating or wondering about what kind of order could we make out of the current moment, and and the relational field of of the group will really help with that. Mm -hmm. We'll look at the way our minds interpret things, the way we're the ways the narratives we're holding on to that would keep us uh, from having a more expanded sense of meaning in the moment. Ways of tying a more general, broad meaning to our own individual callings and what we're here for, uh, and whatever else comes up. And it'll be a combination of us sharing ideas and having a little bit of this kind of conversation, but a lot of focus on our, the participants, breakout rooms, small groups, reflections on assignments or homework which will be optional but and, and easy but but hopefully helpful and then yeah just sharing with the entire group it's very powerful yeah and someone asked if it's going to be recorded and it will be recorded and sent out to participants if you can't make a session for whatever reason um and yeah just to say that i think that you know especially just these times are so extreme and it's really hard if not impossible to do it alone and we don't need to do it alone and i think part of this offering is also about community regulation really right like what does it mean to be in a space where you can um express yourself you can be heard you can be listened to you can be um tended to oh you can contribute that to another and i think this form of community connection feels really really important uh, um, someone asks, is it only for Jews? No, this one's for everyone. This, 
It is open to people all over the world and someone is testifying here. Testi we got a testimony that it's an amazing experience that they want to do again. Um, and someone, someone is watching from Gaza. Ahmed. Yeah. All love to so, Gaza. So good to have you in the house. Um, yeah. We hope you're safe. Um, how can you join? Um, visit malchut.one. That's spelled M-A-L-C-H-U-T dot O-N-E, like the number one. Um, and it's forward slash offerings, but you'll, you'll see a link to it there. Uh, we will also be posting, we've posted information about it uh, on our pages and we'll continue to do so. Yeah. And we can also put this on YouTube so you can listen to this talk on YouTube if you want. Um, yeah, it'll be probably on my channel. Pop quiz, Daniel, are you ready? I love pop quizzes. <laughs> No, um, because, you know, one of the reasons also we're doing this because we talked about the chaos and the order, right, which is very much the Jewish teaching because we just had the month of Adar, which is the holiday of Purim, and it's all about actually chaos. And Nisan is the first month of the Hebrew year. Um, and and if you're wondering, huh, Rosh Hashanah is in September, that's exactly, a whole other that's story. Exactly, that's what I was going to ask you. Tell us. <laughs> oh, uh, there's the lunar year and the is the solar year and this is the beginning of the lunar year wow that was concise i thought <laughs> what does that mean do you want to tell us more about lunar solar i don't know from i don't know from astrology or astronomy <laughs> okay but basically long story short is that nisan is the the first month of the year um you know in an astrological year it's aries right but um part of why we're also doing this course in this month is also an orientation for the year, because energetically they say that like the more intention you build into this month, the more it, um, I hate the word manifest, but right, it trickles out to the whole year. Um, you mean the more parking spots I'll find? Why? The more parking spot. I always associate the word manifest with parking spots because back in the days of the secret, that seemed to be everyone's like selling point, like manifest parking spots. <laughs> oh, I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, what was okay, I is there anything else we haven't? Oh yeah, about? and I should say, like, and I should say, it, it's for everybody. You know, we're gonna we'll we'll Jew it up to some extent because we're both Jewish, and 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 especially Hadar's teachings come from that tradition. But this isn't primarily a course about what Judaism has to say about this. It's a course about what's possible in this moment. But yeah. if you like the enrichment of some ideas that come from our tradition, then um, even better. Yeah, totally. Is there something you want to close off with just teachings of Passover or just, yeah, and uh, yeah, something you want to leave people to think for Passover? Okay, here's just off the top of my head. Sure. In the Passover story, the Jews were instructed to paint lamb's blood on their door to indicate to the angel of death, don't come here. This is not an Egyptian house, which would mean that the firstborn was spared. Let's take the case that, that the bigger meaning, meaning of that could be that God wants us to show and prove in some way, <laughs> wants us to end. It's not enough to say, oh, I'm pro-justice or whatever. I sympathize with the Palestinian plight. Mm -hmm. What is that lamb's blood for you? How do you show your values rather than just profess them? And uh, not to say that the angel of death is coming for everyone who doesn't, but the angel of something is coming, the angel of consequence, the angel of regret, at the very least, the angel of regret. Like, damn, I really wish I had something, you know? Yeah. So, but anyway, I think that was pretty good for an improvised, improvised uh, yeah. teaching. I like if that. I knew, it, if I knew anything about the Bible, I could be a rabbi. <laughs> You brought the lamb in. I love the lamb. Um, 
Yeah, well, I will say two things. I think my favorite section of Passover is the Halach Ma'anya, which is mm. um, the Aramaic um, prayer, um, right? Because the matzah, part of the matzah is like the poor man's bread, the right? Bread that has a, affliction. Yeah, right. the bread of affliction. Um, and part of what we say in Halach Ma'anya is like, this is the bread of affliction, but there's also a prayer in there that like, for all those who need and all those who are hungry that God provides for them. Um, and I think that, right, also that kind of dedication in the Passover Seder that, um, which we have a lot in different Jewish prayers as well, but like that God really is the abundant one and can provide for all. And, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, we show up with our values, we show up with how we can but sometimes everything we do is not enough right and i think it's also kind of like that prayer that god who is the all-powerful the most merciful one like can actually step in um and i think especially about the famine that's going on in the uh deliberate starvation of the people of gaza and just how intense that is and to really um yeah that that prayer for nourishment um physical and spiritual um and then the other thing i will just say is about um taking risks mm. you know i think i think that sometimes for a lot of people in the jewish community they're scared to um do something for a holiday that feels like it's going against the religion or whatever it is or they're like oh i don't know enough so i can't do this thing or you know whatever it is but for me, part of being Jewish and honoring the Jewish lineage is also um, to understand that it's a evolution, right? Like, it's not like, oh, this is just what happened and this is what we do now because of that. It's like every generation, right? Behold of door, like the Passover Seder says that like every generation a person has to see themselves as if they were part of the story. And I think that every year, the the meaning of Passover and the narratives and how we hold it, like it does get updated. Yeah. And it must get updated, right? With yeah. everything happening in Palestine. Like there's no other way that we we cannot actually continue Jewish tradition without actually being in relationship with Palestinians and what's happening in Palestine. And I think that even if sometimes that feels scary of like, oh well what does that mean? Like I invite people to step into that discomfort of it and also take a risk of like what does it look like to step forward into that integration um because i really do believe in my heart that um part of you know ending zionism and the liberation of palestinian people also has to come with the liberation of judaism right and the liberation of jewish people um from the hold that zionism has on it so to me like the more that we find pathways of actually connecting our Jewish lineage with Palestinian people and Palestinian reality, the more we're kind of carving space for that possibility. You know, you just gave me a whole new way of thinking about that, the whole door, 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 that in every generation we should see ourselves as, because I've always heard that as a kind of burden. Like in every generation, I should feel guilty that I wasn't there and I should pretend that I was there and I should act as if God sent me out of slavery. And that's just, it's like, well, I wasn't, God damn it. Like, so what do you want from me? But it's, that's one way of looking at it. That's a defensive way of looking at it. An inviting way of looking at it would be, I need to pull the story to me. I need to look at my life right now as if Egypt is here, as if Moses is here, as if Pharaoh is here, as if plagues are here, as if there's a burning bush I'm not seeing. You know, I don't have to go anywhere in my mind in order to place myself in the story. I have to place the story in myself and see what's so in the light of the story. That's what stories are for, as opposed to some kind of historical role play thing, like a video game where, like, I imagine myself coming out and no, like, Bring the story here and see how here looks different if I do that. Yeah, and I think that's part of why so many people find religion boring is because yeah. they hold it as like a historicized view of what happened. But yeah. that's ex like 
to me, religion is exactly that, right? It's like actually in the present. How is this relating to me now? Good okay, way to go up. Well, what? Good way to go up. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for everyone for sharing their thoughts and comments. Um, thanks, Daniel, for doing this live with me. Thank you, Hadar. I, you'll make me a collaborator on this, yeah? Sure. Yeah, we'll save it so you can watch again if you and want. And I, I will. I will put it on YouTube. Okay. Great. And everybody, uh, subscribe to the Bad House Barah podcast if you haven't yet. Me and Matt Lieb are having fun over there with not very fun things, but people seem to find it useful. So. Okay, well then subscribe to my Substack too because there's a lot of really nice things going on there. If you want writing. Well, I, I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I always bought a promotion, but yeah. Okay. Talk to you. Bye, guys. Bye, Hedda.